Istanbul, capital of Turkey in all but name. On her doorstep, the Bosphorus, the thin strip of water that divides Asia from Europe and East from West. Her people and her religion come from the Asian shore. For 500 years, the teachings of Muhammad have dominated Istanbul. Today, this city, where once strutted the legions of Rome, is graced by the finest mosques of all Islam. In their blood are the fierce tribes of Asia who took the city from the Christians and then created the once vast Ottoman Empire. But their sultans, who ruled within these gilded domes, were overtaken by the new creed of industry then invading Europe. Their empire collapsed, the Sultanate fell, and in 1923 a republic was born. Now, 50 years on, Echo examines the new Turkey, a country that has thrown off the dead weight of her past. Turkey's republic has been dominated by one man, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. When he died in 1938, he had already laid the foundations of modern Turkey. An iron man, he raised the revolution, expelled an invading army, and in 1923 proclaimed the republic. Few men have so dominated the destiny of their country. As a dictator, he imposed parliamentary democracy, the separation of state and religion, the emancipation of women, and a rigid constitution guaranteeing individual freedom. Above all, Ataturk was a soldier. To this day, his most jealous guardians are the army. They see themselves as the protectors of his ideals and the guarantors of the revolution he began. Twice they've intervened to save it, once in 1960 and again in 1971. The forces of dissension were beginning to shred the very fabric of Turkey. Behind the protected walls of the universities, Marxist students were arming for bloody revolution. <laughs> Student violence erupted in Istanbul and Ankara. The Israeli consul general was murdered, other foreigners kidnapped. Communiques appeared from a Turkish Liberation Army sounding alarmingly similar to the Arab Black September organization. The Turks, who detest public disorder, had had enough. And so had the army. The general staff imposed martial law, isolated the men of violence, and demanded a new government that would enforce order in the streets and social reform in parliament. Suleiman Demirel, Prime Minister since 1965, was given a choice, resign or be thrown out. He chose political survival. But the new government would still be civilian. The army was unwilling to become a junta. Parliament went back to work under the scrutiny of army headquarters. Standing between the military and an indecisive parliament was 70-year-old ex-soldier President Cevdet Sunay and the grand old man of Turkish politics, Ismet Inanu, once Ataturk's right-hand man. Through them, the army laid out a program of reforms to be carried out before a new election in 1973. But even under pressure, parliament refused to be browbeaten. 
The reforms were to take nearly three years and three prime ministers to carry them through. Jevdet Sunai was a tired man when his term of office expired in March this year, but the army saw him off in style. Sunai's successor, they hoped, would be another old soldier. The army chief of staff, General Goler, resigned ahead of his time, ready for the job of president. Once at a Turk sat here, like an old schoolmaster with a class of wayward children. But times have changed. We can't be treated like a platoon of soldiers, in Anu said. Parliament defied the army. General Goler was rejected. He needed 218 votes, but got only 81. The army lost face, but the reasons to interfere had gone. Democracy had found its feet again. It took 14 ballots to find a compromise president. A retired admiral, Fari Koroturk. The man behind Parliament's defiance was Suleiman Demirel. Deposed in 1971, he's still an astute politician. Nevertheless, it took the army to force reforms he couldn't get through Parliament. The Marxist revolutionaries who precipitated Demirel's downfall are still on trial. Many had been trained by Palestinian terrorists in Lebanon and Syria. They had hidden masses of Czech arms, explosives and uniforms under university buildings. Now their revolution has ended in Turkish courts. Martial law has been lifted, the streets have been pacified. The reforms of the last three years have given the Turks a fresh start on the road to progress laid out by Ataturk. Turkey's democracy has survived its severest test. The question now is whether the prosperity and the lifestyle of booming Ankara and Istanbul can be spread to the rest of Turkey. Ataturk emancipated Turkey's women in the 30s. Veils haven't been worn in Ankara since their mother's day. But out in the countryside, where six out of ten Turks live, old traditions are still powerful. Fifty percent are illiterate. The prosperity of the cities has not yet reached them. Last year, in a brave gesture in the world fight against drugs, Turkey banned one of her peasants' most valuable crops, opium. But in return, the government passed the long-awaited land reforms that will enable millions of peasants to own the land they have tilled for centuries. To replace camels with tractors and ignorance with knowledge, the government has launched a vast expansion of rural education and investment. But Ataturk's revolution still has a long way to run. This family firm is still happy to make bricks the same way the ancient Egyptians did. The elders are content with the old way. The young must comply or leave for the cities. Here they find a different world. The countryside may still belong to the ways of Asia, the cities belong to Europe. Turkey sees herself economically a part of Europe. She would like full membership of Europe's common market by 1995. Already, half a million of her young men work there. The Turks are proud of being the cultural, economic and geographic link between Asia and Europe. If Europe's common market is eventually to achieve political unity, Turkey's presence within the Union would have a profound effect on its attitude to the rest of the world. In the 50th year of her republic, Turkey has chosen to symbolize this vision by building a great bridge across the Bosphorus. It is the first physical link between Europe and Asia since the Emperor Darius built a bridge of boats for his armies two and a half thousand years ago. 
But today's bridge is not for armies. It is an artery of trade between two continents.